<laughs> Hi, Sandy. Hi, Barbara. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. I just made you co-host, so um, okay, great. Should help. Uh, and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining a little earlier. Feel free to go get a glass of water or whatever you need. But we usually have a pretty large group for these uh, programs, so it's nice to sign in early. I I appreciate that. See, Sandy, I'm going to make sure that we have I have that PDF open as well, just to make sure if we do need a backup mm -hmm. that it got it. Good. Thank you. So thank you to you and Rick for pulling this program together. The, uh, that PDF will be helpful too. I'll probably try to send it along in the follow-up email. Yeah, it's it's quite large, so I don't okay. know whether you have the ability to make a link, um, uh, you know, do a Dropbox type of. Yes, yeah, I'll um, I'll fig I'll figure that out. You know, there's a lot of things I'm going to have to figure out how to to add to our website or you know create a link to make it easier to access. So. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Paul. Hey, Paul. <laughs> hey, Paul. <laughs> hey, Rick. <laughs> oh, hi, Rick. Yeah, figured it out. We're, we're all here. <laughs> yeah. Barbara, did you get the map of uh, the state of New Hampshire that I had sent you? Um, it showed, did you send it, it recently? or Last Friday. It showed all of the towns who were members of NHHC. Oh, yes, I did. I did. Um, I did get that. Good. That's just for proofreading at the moment. If you see mistakes, okay. let me know. Excellent. Hey, Pete. You're muted. Hello. Yep. <laughs> I'm going to be, but I just hit the key. Yep. Good to see everyone. Ah, yeah. A little more. Oh, I'm getting I'm getting all kinds of texts and people need to get in sandy would you be able to admit people just for a second while oh, i sure on to this test yep yeah i just saw that yeah thank you mm -hmm. I'm going to shut off my video while I'm having lunch. Very distracting and we don't want people to get hungry. <laughs> yeah, good, good idea. Thank you. That's fine. I think, you know, having this at a lunch hour, we we certainly have to um, allow people to eat a little something. Yeah. I get that. If it's any good, you have to share, though. <laughs> I know. Wouldn't it be nice if we could have this big banquet and everybody together? Like don't worry, we'll be there soon enough. We have a couple programs at the end in person, so that'll be fun. Hi, Sylvia. Hi, Jenny. How are you? Hi, Barbara. Hi, Elizabeth. We've got everyone in person, so we did a potluck and we've got six oh. minutes, so it's a good way to do lunch. <laughs> that is definitely a great way to do lunch. And um I'm so glad that you're able to to present our programs in person. We were just saying it'd be nice to get together and have have lunch, but doing it regionally like that's the perfect way to go. Yeah, no, we really appreciate you doing all the coordinating and uh, getting all the, the trainings lined up for us, too. It works really well. It's a great collaboration. Wonderful. Yeah, well, you've got a great space for it, so I'm glad that worked out. Yeah, it is a, it is nice to have the space that we have here. And I think we've got 11 people signed up today. So people are filtering in, getting some soup. And uh, it's been nice to have discussion afterwards, too, to be able yeah. to share stories and figure and out. And absolutely, if, if there's any specific questions that you have in those follow-up discussions, let me know if I can provide you with more information or Rick or Sandy. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Sure. 
So it's great to see so many people here signed up for our second session of the wetlands training program. It's certainly been very popular and I've, I've had a lot of uh, great feedback just from the first um, program that we presented last month on um, introduction to wetlands identification. So we're kind of moving forward with uh, more information in a kind of step-by-step -step process for you because we we've recognized you know when I first started working at NHACC um, a lot of people had questions about wetlands how to review wetland permits and and really needed a lot more training and we've certainly done some training over the years uh, we've always had one or two programs at our conference but this um, training series really kind of pulls it all together and so again, I've, I really appreciate um, New Hampshire DES, Sandy Crystal and Rick Vanderpoel for, for helping out um, designing the programs and, and covering all this information for NHACC. We really are lucky to have them both. So I'll wait one more minute before we officially start the program. But again, welcome and feel free to grab a drink or eat your sandwich or what whatever. Uh, you're going to do while you have a chance to, to listen to our program today. And Barbara, I'm happy to, you know, admit folks that might end up coming in late. Um, oh, okay. I'll just keep an eye on it. As yeah, keep an eye on it. Once once I get through with my uh, introduction, I'll, I'll be able to, to um, yeah. do it no problem. No but I just had a couple people trying to reach me, so I wanted to get respond to them. <clears throat> so it's noon, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. And again, um, welcome to everybody. My name is Barbara Richter, and I'm the executive director at the New Hampshire Association of Conservation Commissions. And at NHACC, we're a nonprofit organization working to, to support uh, conservation commissions so that they can better protect their local natural resources. And we provide education and assistance to 217 conservation commissions here in New Hampshire. We represent our members, um, the state legislature and on boards and committees throughout the state. Uh, we have a popular conference the first Saturday of November. Um, and we also try to provide regional uh, meetings and outreach as well. So before we get started, though, I just want to, um, I just have a few reminders. Please um, go ahead and hit your mute button. Again, it's a large group today, and there, there may be a lot of background noise happening. So um, we'd appreciate it if you stay muted for the program. Uh, we do invite you to ask questions, but we're going to ask that you use the chat box in the bottom of your screen there. Uh, we might have a little bit of time between presenters to, to do a couple questions that are specific to that um, topic, but then at the end, we'll have more, more time to go over questions. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, this is the second session. This is Wetlands Laws and Clarification of Local, State, and Federal Jurisdiction with Rick Vanderpoel and Sandy Crystal. So we created this um, training series for conservation commissions so that they can better evaluate their local water resources and develop a more proactive program to protecting those. Um, we worked with New Hampshire DES and um, the certified wetland scientists that are here today to help create this program and develop more of a um, full curriculum. So in today's program, we're going to cover um, delineation and classification of state jurisdictional areas the role of DES in the wetland permit review process, um, an overview of the Army Corps general permit, and when New Hampshire DES wetlands mitigations required, 
And then we'll touch on some local regulations and how your commission may be involved in, in local um, ordinances. So we've invited uh, Rick and Sandy here today to provide this overview of the federal, state, and local regulations um, that will help Conservation Commission members determine what agency has the authority over each of those jurisdictions. So Sandy Crystal is a professional wetland scientist and a Bow Conservation Commission member. Um, many of you may remember Sandy from her time at DES. She worked at New Hampshire DES for more than 23 years, serving in the wetland and watershed bureaus. She also worked in the Drinking Water and Groundwater Bureau, coordinating the Source Water Protection Land Conservation Grant Program. And she serves on two boards in town. She's on the planning board, as well as the chair of the Bow Conservation Commission. And Dr. Rick Vanderpoel is the principal of Ecosystem Management Consultants out of Sandwich, New Hampshire, and he's been a certified wetland scientist since 1998. His company has conducted wetland delineations and wetlands assessments in more than 128 New Hampshire towns, and he's taught various wetland courses at Antioch New England Graduate School and Plymouth State University. So I'd like to welcome them both to the program today. Welcome, Sandy and Rick. I'll have you take it from here, and I'm happy to take over the admitting process. Great. All right. Well, Sandy, take it away. <laughs> Yeah, I guess if I unmute, I'd be uh, yeah, that a helps. Uh, good idea. Uh, yeah, I had the screen up, but didn't unmute. Thank you. So um, uh, glad to be here um, with this um, second session. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, authorities and resources protected under state, federal, and local jurisdiction um, for wetlands and wetlands-related permitting. Um, and we'll touch on aspects of a resource identification that are relevant to permitting. Um, so New Hampshire's, um, so th these are the areas we'll cover. Um, uh, New Hampshire's law regulating dredge and fill impacts to wetlands and other resources was initially enacted in 1967 for um, tidal waters and resources and expanded to freshwater resources in 1969. Um, so the, um, oh, it, let me just say what this first paragraph um, goes on to say is to talk about the wetlands functions and values that are important and the reason for the um, law uh, and subsequent rules protecting wetlands. So we won't focus on that today, but um, subsequent sessions will be uh, both classroom and field. We'll talk about um, functions and values and wetland assessment. Um, so the um, RSA 42A talks about um, these tidal areas and, and upland um, areas adjacent to tidal areas and wherever freshwater flows or stands. So you have freshwater wetlands as well as uh, surface waters um, and gets into some other aspects of um, surface waters that are raised uh, by dams and such, which we won't go into today. Um, so in the DES rules, it talks about, gives a definition of jurisdictional area and lists all of these and I could, stop here, but clearly um, there's a lot more to it than just this uh, list provides. Uh, I also want to mention that when we talk about these jurisdiction areas, we're um, talking about them in light of the fact that the areas that are um, the activities that are regulated in these areas um, are um, construction as well as dredge and fill and there are um, descriptions in um, the definitions in the DES rules for dredge and fill is a noun and fill is a verb. Um, and other aspects of dredge might may include things like rutting um, because you're disturbing the contour of the uh, ground in a wetland or jurisdictional area. 
So we'll be focusing more on the jurisdictional areas versus the activities, but I wanted to put this out there as um, this is part of the law as well. Um, so the uh, wetlands have a kind of a standard definition that they've had for years. Um, basically, it's talking about how it needs water uh, saturation um, and that uh, really causes hydric soils to form um, because there are saturated soil conditions and you get uh, vegetation um, that's adapted to um, living in those conditions. Um, there are uh, basically four references that are used um, that are cited in the rules for um, delineation of wetlands or determination of, of uh, wetlands. And that is uh, some parts of the 1987 core wetland delineation manual are still used. Uh, then there's the uh, 2012 uh, regional supplement to the manual. And that regional supplement, which covers uh, what you call a north central and northeast region, um, also has a place in there that talks about where the 2012 manual has updated the 1987 information. So that's a good one to um, take a look at. Uh, you have field indicators for identifying hydric soils. And then the Corps of Engineers maintains the regional uh, wetland plant lists. And I'll um, get into that in another slide or two. So in terms of uh, indicators of wetland hydrology, um, there is a the core has a wetland determination data form um, that's used by wetland scientists to um, document um, their uh, delineation, or at least their determinations at a, a, a couple of points or, or more. Um, there are actually uh, about 18 different indicators of wetland hydrology listed on that form, although probably at least um, half of them are, are used um, frequently in New Hampshire. So I'm only listing four of them here uh, as examples. Um, you have drift deposits where you have water that's um, been usually uh, flooding uh, of some sort, and there's some uh, flow direction that causes the um, uh, woody materials and, and plant debris to be deposited against one side of a, uh, like a, a tree trunk. That's uh, one of the examples of drift deposits. Uh, the top right, you have water stained leaves, which is probably um, one of the more common ways that we see um, or can start looking at areas and say, oh, gee, that, that may be a wetland has water stained leaves. Uh, the bottom left, it's aquatic fauna. Um, that is a caddisfly case, and um, it's a remnant of, of a caddisfly when it was in its larval stage, and the, the cases are left over. And on the bottom right is when you have um, um, surface water uh, close to the surface, and um, you can um, have shallow, um, shallow uh, groundwater, and so... Um, that's another indication of wetland hydrology. You dig a hole, let it sit for a while because initially you may not see water in it. And um, so that's um, the, a, a few of the wetland hydrology indicators. Um, okay, what is this? Oh, okay. Um, hydric soils, um, where there's enough water um, to saturate soil for a period of time uh, during the growing season, um, hydric soils will form. And there are these uh, redoxymorphic features. I uh, use that Munsell color chart in the middle with the um, document, the reference field indicators for identifying hydric soils in New England. And um, may use an auger or a... Um, a tile spade to be able to make a hole and, and look for the, um, uh, the specific indicators. One thing that's good about hydric soils is that uh, even when there's a drought, uh, the soils retain their um, 
features, the redoxymorphic features. So it, it's not so dependent upon um, the, the seasonal wetness being present. So the third indicator um, is the wetland vegetation. Um, as I mentioned about the um, National Wetland Plant List that's maintained by the Corps of Engineers, um, that um, graphic in the top right corner is actually the website for the Corps of Engineers where you can download um, a plant list. Um, the wetland vegetation that we look at and uh, that are also known as hydrophytes, kind of water loving plants include uh, grass like plants and you have grasses, sedges and rushes, you have herbaceous plants that include ferns, aquatic plants, your, you know, you would call wildflowers that grow in, in, in wetlands, um, and you have woody plants like shrubs and trees. Um, some plants will tend to always be in wetland, and some plants are less often in wetland, and there's a whole uh, scheme of indicators that I'm not going to go through here. Um, so some plants may be considered um, that they tend to grow more often in uplands, but they can have morphological adaptations, and so that's something um, that uh, on the wetland determination form and that um, 2012 uh, manual is a helpful reference. So transitioning to wetlands that can also be surface waters, um, we have vernal pools. Uh, vernal pools have always been um, considered um, jurisdictional in New Hampshire, but in 2008, um, DES put out rules that define specifically what a vernal pool is, um, so that there are some criteria for people to kind of uh, measure against. So they typically have a wet dry cycle. Um, they form in a shallow basin. These are um, the criteria that are in the rule um, in the uh, definition that's quite a long definition. Um, vernal pools are significant because they are a unique habitat. They um, provide habitat for uh, species that um, uh, benefit from the lack of uh, fish because if it dries out for part of the year, um, they don't have that predation. And um, so they've, they've adapted. So um, I'll go on to describe their you need to have one or more primary vernal pool indicators or at least three secondary vernal pool indicators. The primary vernal pool indicators, um, starting at the top left, you have a wood frog, which is incredibly camouflaged when it goes through the woods, um, and the egg masses that are laid um, uh, by the females. Um, then you have in the center, you have fairy shrimp, uh, which tend to be in vernal pools at the earlier uh, side of things when the water is cooler. And then you have the egg mass and uh, the spotted salamander and the spotted salamander. Um, though we're getting into the vernal pool season and wood frogs, if you have not experienced them, make a quacking sound. So if you're in the woods and you hear a quacking sound, you'll um, you know, you can find your way to vernal pools that you never knew existed by following that quacking sound. So um, the definition for secondary vernal pool indicators is very long, and actually it's not all inclusive. It basically says it's all these things and, you know, includes all these things. So it includes a lot of the um, macroinvertebrates that, that um, uh, live in vernal pools as part of their cycle. Um, like on the left, it's the larva of the predaceous diving beetle. You have the caddisfly case in the middle, and then the um, uh, flat uh, snail um, shell um, at the right that are also things that um, the bottom two, the right two, that you can find when the vernal pool is, is dried up. So moving on to surface waters, um, New Hampshire's wetlands law includes surface water. So you have both flowing waters like streams and rivers, 
And then you have um, water bodies like uh, lakes and ponds that are um, part of that. All the uh, flowing waters are um, surface waters that are flowing waters are um, really kind of grouped into uh, being a water course. So you have a scoured channel with evidence of sediment transport, or um, there's a channel that connects uh, to and from a wetland or other surface water. Um, the water courses can be divided into um, these are fresh water, primarily perennial stream, intermittent stream, and ephemeral stream. And accurately identifying the resources, uh, particularly when you have a permit application um, for review before you, is really essential um, because of the criteria and the rules that um, talk about length of impact. And so you need to know um, the length of impact to an ephemeral or an intermittent stream will be uh, calculated differently than an, uh, an impact to a perennial stream. Um, I know in another training uh, in the future, we're going to cover more about the thresholds for such impacts and the effects on the permitting process. Um, these are also sometimes, you know, intermittent stream, ephemeral stream can be very difficult if you're not there at the right time of year, but it's also um, crucial to do site uh, visits um, to help inform your review of projects. Um, so the bank of a uh, surface water is an important resource and specific jurisdictional area. Uh, it's basically like a buffer strip um, to surface waters. Um, it's important to be able to identify where the bank is because when you um, uh, when there are impacts to a stream, if it's a uh, perennial stream, you're going to count the impact to each bank. Uh, as well as the impact to the stream. So for a crossing of a, a, a 10 foot strip across that stream, you will have 30 um, linear feet of impact essentially, in addition to the square footage. So um, it's uh, really important once again, to identify that, that bank and whether you have a perennial or a, um, an intermittent stream. So um, tidal and estuarine areas are um, very productive and valuable habitats and um, significant resources wherever they're present. But with New Hampshire's um, smaller coastal area, these have an increased significance. So in the um, 2019 rules, um, there was a kind of grouped up all the coastal resources, um, the coastal lands and tidal waters and wetlands are grouped and called um, coastal areas. Uh, the coastal lands include the um, vegetated and non-vegetated um, tidal areas as well as the tidal buffer zone, uh, 100 feet above the highest observable tide line and the uh, and sand dunes as well. Um, in the um, resources, um, the jurisdictional areas, there are some that have been called out and uh, just like projects are uh, classified as minimum, minor, or major, and some, some jurisdictional resources um, are significant enough to cause something to be a, a major impact project. So these resources have been grouped into um, some of these have been grouped into a uh, priority resource area. So it's a jurisdictional area. Um, you may have um, a natural, natural Heritage Bureau um, uh, occurrences uh, documented uh, nearby um, using the data check tool. Um, bogs are um, a resource that's been and highlighted in the law specifically for many years. Um, another priority resource area is a floodplain wetland that's contiguous to a 
tier three uh, water course or higher. And, and a tier three means it has a watershed of um, a square mile or more. And then the higher water course, tier four, are actually the um, tidal waters. Uh, designated prime wetlands have always been um, highlighted um, and uh, elevated projects to a, a major impact or the duly established 100 foot buffer for those that um, that uh, had a buffer established within a certain period of time. Um, those of you that have been around for many years uh, probably know that the designated prime wetland has undergone a lot of changes over the years. Um, kind of cut back on um, what's actually protected. Um, another air priority resource areas, those um, coastal resources um, are um, priority resource areas. Um, I did want to um, specifically address Bob's, um, not only because they're um, valuable, um, they're not a resource that can be replaced, um, in any um, short period of time. Um, but also um, people have tended to use the term bog when things are really wet. I, you know, they don't they don't know the differences among things and, and bog has a specific uh, term. It's a type of peatland. Um, so it's uh, where the um, it's a saturated uh, wetland. Um, that the material, um, plant material, and it's often been, you know, it's often sphagnum moss, but the plant material doesn't decay and it accumulates and it forms these peat deposits. And um, uh, bogs tend to have some, um, bogs tend to get their water from uh, more groundwater sources. Uh, other peatland types includes fens and peat swamps. And um, if you, um, there's a specific definition in the rules for, um, it refers to the Natural Heritage Bureau Natural Communities Guide um, regarding bogs. Um, and then there's also, um, UNH has a peatlands brochure that may be uh, helpful. And um, there's also a book that I will also mention at the end called um, uh, The Nature of New Hampshire. Um, that's kind of more of a layman's version of the natural communities, and it's um, helpful in telling the difference between bog and fen and, um, okay, let's see. So um, we're going to transition here to um, Rick now, so um, talking about more water-related resources. Thanks, Sandy. That's great. Um, good summary of, of what a wetland is and where our jurisdictional areas are under the guise of our state laws and rules. Um, I wanted to, you know, so far we've talked about uh, wet areas, but I wanted to include or point out that in spite of the fact that the state of New Hampshire is pretty much the only state in New England that does not have a wetland buffer law, that is to say protecting uh, upland areas adjacent to wetlands. It does have a Shoreland Protection Act and that is um, protects certain water bodies. Um, so just in that first slide, you can see examples of where there may be a shoreland as defined by the dictionary, something along a shore, land along a shore that's generally upland. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Sandy, thank you. Um, and in this, in our state, we have uh, both a law and rules that support that law that regulate activities near certain shorelands. So in this case, you can look at uh, this sort of four bullet area of jurisdiction that the state has over lakes and ponds, and they have to be greater than 10 acres, otherwise known as a great pond. And that's something, of course, that's uh, common to most northeastern states. They use that 10 acre minimum as a size after which the state has juris 
there's jurisdiction not just of the pond itself and the waters within that pond, but often uh, any activities within a certain distance from that pond. Rivers are the same thing. Um, in this diagram on the right, you can see that two first order streams or what we call perennial streams, when they join together, they become a second order stream. Two second order streams join together to form a third and so on. And any fourth order stream or larger is considered within the state's jur jurisdiction for shorelands. And we'll talk more specifically about what that jurisdiction is going forward. There are also in our state, based on the law, the option of designating third order streams as a particular valuable resource that the state can have jurisdiction over. However, the primary difference is that whereas with a fourth order or larger stream, the state has a 250 foot uh, zone back from the what they call the reference line or ordinary high water mark. Uh, in a third order stream, it's only 50 feet. And then last but not least, as Sandy mentioned, we have a highest observable tide line um, buffer zone of 100 feet for our small coastal areas. Thanks, Sandy. So the Shoreline Water Quality Protection Act, which used to be called the Comprehensive Shoreland Protection Act, uh, was first passed in 1991. Uh, the intent, of course, was to protect the water quality of our rivers and lakes. And it did so by establishing a three-tiered zone wherein which certain activities were allowed. We start with the nearest to the water zone, the what is called the waterfront buffer, that's 50 horizontal horizontal feet away from the reference line, so-called, as you can see in that um, diagram. And that reference line generally equates to the mean average high water mark. Um, that is to say, um, that which has been established over time, whether or not the water body is naturally occurring or is artificially dammed. And you can look online and at, uh, using some of the resource links at the end of this program to see what elevation those reference lines are for the water bodies of our state that fall under that jurisdiction. And within that 50 foot, uh, there are some significant limitations. I won't go into all of them, but as many of you know, uh, it has to do with how much vegetation you have to leave uh, versus how much you want to clear for a view. And it has to do what kind of uh, impervious areas you, that are allowable and what types of pathways as well to the edge of the waterfront. Uh, up from that, you have a 150 foot zone, which is uh, also has certain limitations relative to structures and other um, impervious surfaces, how much is allowable within that 150 to 50 foot zone. And then finally, there's some additional limitations all the way back to 250 feet from the edge of the reference line on these uh, shoreland areas. Next slide, please. So we've got several different ways in which that shoreland area is protected. It's not just for say building necessarily, it's also for um, changing the surface topography of the land. And if you do so, um, the alteration of terrain permit is required to maintain and uphold the water quality standards. And in, in a shoreland zone, that alteration of terrain permit kicks in at a smaller size than it does if you're away from that shoreland zone. In the uh, SWQPA, the Shoreland Water Quality Protection Act, um, there are other restrictions I mentioned briefly about um, things like lawn and plant fertilizers, um, how much impervious area you are allowed to install or construct in that zone. And then, uh, of course, septic tank and leach field setbacks, which uh, kicks in under uh, uh, subsurface rules as well. That is to say, the standards that we have apply. Um, generally speaking, these septic system setbacks are 50 feet from poorly drained soils and 75 feet from very poorly drained soils. And that applies as well to the reference line. Um, tidal, however, they have a little bit of a higher standard 
And uh, so we're looking at, again, 100 feet minimum uh, for anything that affects the subsurface water quality. Uh, but keep in mind, as we'll, Ms. Andy will remind you in a few slides ahead, that our state jurisdiction can be, uh, um, how shall I say, enhanced and potentially improved by implying local regulations that may increase those setback distances this, that the state currently allows. And if you look across this, the municipalities of the state, we have setbacks from various water bodies and wetlands uh, that vary from anywhere from 25 to 400 feet, which I think is the largest one that, that's applied on a, on a municipal basis. Next slide. Thank you. So we're gonna just do a brief tour through the Army Corps of Engineers um, jurisdiction and Keep in mind, just you know, it's it's federal government, and you know, we we have, of course, in our state, uh, generally two tiers, and in certain towns, we add a third tier of regulation relative to activities that may dredge or fill uh, a surface water or wetland. Uh, but the Army Corps has been at it longest. Um, our wetlands law only dates back to 1969, but the Army Corps has been regulating uh, navigable waters since the Rivers and Harbors Act. Of 1899. And if you look even back further, you have uh, the designation of the public domain or the public trust waters, which had very much to do with fishing back in the day in the early 1800s, wherein case law through the Supreme Court established that these waters of the public were allowed to be utilized by the public and not regulated by any, any governmental agency. And that, you know, over the different case law acts that were passed, um, uh, you know, built up, or I should say transitioned to a recognition that navigable waters, which is critical for interstate commerce, uh, needed to be regulated so that certain things that, that um, occurred within those navigable waters would not impair that interstate commerce. And that was the primary basis for the Rivers and Harbors Act, 1899. And that was really the, the law of the land it, uh, federally until we got up to uh, the late 60s. And at that point in time, um, we were noticing that it wasn't just navigable waters that were being affected by activities within them, but by activities adjacent to them. And so we'll talk more about the uh, Clean Water Act that was uh, passed in 1968 initially and then um, revised and expanded in 1972. So under the federal government, we not only have this overarching jurisdiction over waters of the United States, as it's called, but it, we also have the ability for them to establish permits on a general basis so these general permits under the authority of um, US Code 33 allows for certain states to enter into agreements with the federal government whereby the states take over the permitting actions and are approved by in a general way, the federal government. And if some of those activities exceed a certain limit, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, then the feds have a way to come back into the permitting directly and in fact run the show, so to speak, in terms of what activities are allowed, right? But in New Hampshire, which is actually, I think a very good thing for those of us that work in this field, uh, we've been under for, for a couple of decades now, a statewide general permit that gets issued and updated every 10 years. And our last authorization was just last year in 2022. Next slide, please. So getting back a little bit more on the Rivers and Harbors Act, uh, the critical term to take away from this that I mentioned before is navigable waters. And that's something that we wanna just take a look a little more closely because that was the basis by which activities that may affect navigable waters got commuted into the Clean Water Act uh, almost a, a hundred years later. Um, next slide, please. So navigable waters um, are ones that are subject to the ebb and flow of tide, and they may be used or have been used in the past for interstate or foreign commerce. And in New Hampshire, we really have you know, very little 
ebb and flow of tidal waters. And Great Bay really uh, is the, the keynote area that is affected by that. And so you may think, well, gee, that's not very much. And so, you know, what business does the federal government have in regulating our waters of the state? And that's where this, as the, the last slide indicated, any physical, chemical, or biological impacts upstream of the navigable waters uh, come into play. So that, for example, in Great Bay, as many of you know, we've had a lot of water pollution impairment. Our, our you know, our, the Great Bay beds have been greatly affected, the oyster beds, uh, and so on. And that has uh, largely been because of the inputs from the Squamscott, the lamprey, the oyster, and other rivers into uh, Great Bay. So it's important to think, even though this was the original basis of the federal government oversight, that we have to look a little bit more upstream to really see why they expanded that jurisdiction in 1970, or actually 1968. Next slide, please. So the Clean Water Act uh, was initially, like I said, passed in 68 as the Federal Water Pollution Control Act. And interestingly, New Hampshire had a role to play in that. We actually had discharges from the uh, Lincoln paper mill going into the Pema Jawasset River. And I can attest, I grew up on the Pemi, that uh, it was unfishable, it was stinky, it was gross and yellow, and it was absolutely an awful water body. And it was not unusual in the country. We had a lot of, you know, Love Canal, we had all these places, Lake Erie, that were being affected. And it was, uh, of course, the downstream effects of these discharges going into upstream rivers had to be regulated because people weren't sort of practicing, practicing good environmental common sense at the time. And so we passed this Water Pollution Control Act as the preceptual uh, act to, to um, try and clean up the waterways of the, of the country. And uh, Section 401 of the 1972 uh, update uh, primarily deals with the water quality issues itself. And then of course, any dredge and fill material uh, into the waters of the United States is, co is covered under section 404. Um, and there's just a link there that you can use uh, after this show to get to um, you know, good descriptions of what those uh, 401 and 404 uh, sections are, are all about. Next slide, please. So uh, the basic premise is that no dredge or fill material can be uh, uh, discharged and into waters of the United States Unless, if there is a practicable alternative that is less damaging, and that the, if you do so, that the nation's waters would be significantly degraded. So you have to sort of pass that acid test, right? And when, for, when you apply for a permit, you have to go through that sort of sequencing of you know, avoidance and minimization. And then if you can't avoid and minimize entirely and you will have a degradation taking place, then you have to compensate for the loss of those uh, functions in the water bodies themselves. Next slide, please. So critical to this uh, whole business is what is waters of the United States? And curiously, whereas we had this, we've had this law for now 50 years on the books that have protected waters of the United States, as many of you may know, in our last administration, the president supported a change of the rules that redefined what the waters of the United States were in an effort to reduce the amount of regulation that the federal government had over these waters. Fortunately, and this list of typical waters of the United States uh, was reinstated under the Biden administration and that rule has been uh, published. It's under current public review and is set to be enacted uh, re-established officially in March, that is to say this next month. Uh, and these are what you see here, the A1 waters are the same as we had for 50 years from the Clean Water Act. The tributary definitions are the same. The adjacent wetlands are the same, but the additional waters that's been a little bit more uh, updating, as I should say, on the definition of these additional waters. And if you read down at the bottom, it says lakes, ponds, streams, or wetlands that do not fit into those above categories. And that um, has also been subject to uh, Supreme Court cases, uh, especially regarding the significant nexus standard. And we'll talk just briefly uh, about that next slide. 
So the acid test, right? You've got to have relatively permanent water to be a water of the United States. And that word relative, of course, uh, is, a, is a tricky one because again, this is all about not just the federal jurisdiction, but what, how much the state has to follow the feds in doing their permitting of these waterways and wetlands. So if you have perennial systems or relatively permanent standing waters that are connected to navigable waters, those A1 waters, then yes, it passes the test. Otherwise, it also has to pass uh, on the Clean Water Act basis, their connection and effect on these downstream waters. And there again, it reiterates uh, that definition here, the chemical, physical, or biological integrity. And that's where it gets tricky. We had a big, big court case over in Vernal Pools, for example. Gee, Vernal Pools are isolated. How much are they affecting downstream waters? You know, and there was a big case in the Midwest that went through several years of iteration before the Supreme Court ruled. If there's some a nexus for biological uh, uh, um, activity, and this was at the time mostly identified by migrating birds, then in fact it has an effect and can be included as a water of the United States. And that became known as a significant nexus test that has been incorporated for these additional waters. Next slide, please. So we have a few exclusions um, from this and the feds recognize things like prior converted cropland is not being subject to their jurisdiction, waste water treatment systems, ditches, artificially irrigated areas, artificial lakes and ponds to a point, right? There are certain uh, point or limitations to that uh, where the state picks up. Um, artificial pools, you know, backyard pool, uh, water-filled depressions that do not meet the three-parameter uh, definition of a wetland, for example, and then other swales and erosional features which are uh, impermanent and therefore do not have that significant nexus with navigable waters. So those are the exclusions. Otherwise, we're you know talking about areas that um, uh, really do not satisfy that those two you know uh, tests that I mentioned. And uh, if, if the municipalities want to move on to protect some of those areas, they can do so on their own, on their own merits. So we're gonna segue out of that right now and, and Sandy's gonna finish up with a few slides on the local regulations. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rick. Uh, so yes, we're gonna um, turn to um, the authorities and opportunities um, for local protection of wetlands and surface water resources. <clears throat> so to build on the existing ones at the state and federal level. Um, so RSA 674 is basically what gives the, um, what addresses um, zoning, uh, master plans and the planning board responsibilities. So, um, Zoning ordinances are established to promote health and general welfare and to assure proper use of natural resources and other public requirements. And um, a, a newer section, um, it's been there for a while, uh, called Innovative Land Use Controls um, is where uh, it's called Environmental Characteristic Zoning. Um, can be established in a uh, municipality that has a zoning ordinance, a master plan. Um, so one of the ways to um, uh, do this environmental characteristic zoning is to develop an overlay district. Uh, often that's actually steep slopes are one type of environmental characteristic, characteristic zoning. Um, in regards to what we're talking about today, um, often there's a, uh, a wetland overlay district uh, defined and it's not, um, it's not necessarily drawn on a map and uh, we can talk about that more. Um, and you have a conditional use permit process um, where the, it's reviewed by the planning board and typically the conservation commission uh, will review and provide input to that. Uh, and this is often used in this wetland overlay district in terms of buffers. Uh, some communities regulate the impacts to wetlands and buffers, and some actually 
Um, they look at just the buffers because the state's taking a look at the wetland part of things. Um, so a uh, number of years ago, um, it was put into the RSA that uh, 674, that whenever you use the term wetlands, you have to use the standard wetland definition that's in the state law, that's in RSA 482A, that's used by the Wetlands Bureau, Wetlands Program and such. So once again, it's the, you have uh, surface water or groundwater that uh, saturates the ground. Uh, basically, um, you have saturated soil and you have vegetation that's adapted. So one thing I really want to highlight is that if you have this in the ordinance and you have an overlay district, that's great. But do you have any reference to surface waters? Because this defini definition does not include surface waters. And if you want to have you have buffers on wetlands, to have buffers on surface waters, you have to add another definition. So um, in referencing wetlands, definition as we saw, we have also the reference to surface waters. And um, this is the definition um, that's uh, used uh, by the state and that's uh, helpful. And it's really uh, relates back to RSA 485, 485A2. Um, so the definition of surface waters. So if you um, want to protect both, um, you need to add the surface water de definitions as well as the wetland definitions. Um, uh, and and uh, also uh, really establishing a, a process for um, reviewing applications that come in. What is typically done is that um, the definition of the zone that applies um, may use an existing map, and then it may also uh, refer to um, applying the wetland definition, which means that a certified wetland scientist would have to do the delineation in the field for it to be considered a wetland and reviewed under your ordinance. And then you can establish uh, buffer distances um, to wetlands um, there's a whole range out there. Um, I um, often um, encourage folks not to use size uh, for um, establishing buffers because the size of a wetland doesn't necessarily um, have a direct relationship to its value, especially when we have vernal pools that are so small. Um, there are a number of communities that have a vernal pool specifically referenced in their ordinance and have wetland buffers there as well. So this um, environmental characteristic zoning is the way that you can um, protect your wetland fur uh, wetlands further, wetlands and surface waters, and add this layer of protection that there's um, a ton of uh, research and documentation about how important buffers are to the um, uh, um, functioning of wetlands. And that's the basis behind this, even, even if the state doesn't have it. So I will end with um, making some suggestions about um, recommendations on, on a variety of the points that were mentioned here. Um, I would say if you're not in the midst of reviewing projects right now, Take the time to take a blank standard dredge and fill application and review it. Um, it has a list of uh, protected um, jurisdictional areas. It has a whole lot of information on things that are required and it's so much easier to review it in some ways when you're not under the gun um, to look at um, uh, a, a project and, and really have to um, turn around and, and provide recommendations in a short time frame. Um, it would be if your town has not already developed a natural resources inventory that's helpful, not only for um, highlighting areas um, to protect or maybe high value in terms of permitting or land conservation, 
Um, and But if you have issues, um, if you have a project that comes through that needs a mitigation option, you would may have um, areas identified that are high value there. Um, review your zoning ordinance for potential impact, uh, improvements to better protect wetlands and surface waters. Um, designate prime wetlands. And actually a lot of communities, in addition to what the state may do and, and how it's gotten uh, kind of cut back a bit, is that if you reference those high value wetlands in your zoning ordinance and uh, um, provide a buffer that's appropriate to it, um, you'll provide better uh, protection of them. And then uh, the remaining training sessions should be helpful and provide more information um, that we haven't covered in the previous two. Um, here's a list of variety of resources. Hopefully we can get this in a format that you can uh, use the live links. I did put in the book, um, The Nature of New Hampshire, and that's the book I was talking about that really has a lot of great information um, about plant communities and um, easier to understand than uh, some of the other documents um, that are out there for um, wetland professionals and uh, ecologists. And um, so we covered uh, wetlands and related jurisdiction and jurisdictional areas at the federal, state, and local level. Um, recovered shoreland description, uh, jurisdiction, um, provided some recommendations and some further information. And um, Oh, I know what I didn't on the other list. Um, I forgot earlier the, uh, oh, I did have it on here. Actually, uh, the National Wetland Plant List, um, there's a link and I, I had mentioned that um, that's on here. That wasn't on my earlier version. So um, that's it. And I think we um, have time to take questions. I'm gonna stop sharing for now. Thank Sandy. you, Sandy. Yeah, we do have yeah, a few great. questions. Excellent. I, if I could just uh, dovetail on uh, just a brief on the prime wetlands issue. <laughs> um, I can't help myself. Some of you know <laughs> too much. Um, so you really can't uh, prove a prime wetland through the state at this point in time. So if you wanna do something like that, I really recommend not calling it prime and doing what, what Sandy called it a high value wetland and looking at those as a part of your inventory your natural resources inventory for your town and then passing your own laws locally. Uh, that's really the only way you can do it now until um, we have greater effect in the legislature to overturn what was uh, basically a deal breaker in 2012 for prime wetlands. Oh, thank you. Yeah, good point. I do think that if you're going to protect those prime wetlands and especially your um, any of those uplands or buffer zones that your local wetland uh, ordinance is going to be um, the, the only really way to go, unfortunately. So um, a lot of towns have done that. I think we've, I don't know, 45 or 50 towns in New Hampshire have wetland local wetland ordinances and I have examples and there's there's great information so I'm I'm happy to follow up if you have specific questions about a local wetland ordinance um but uh we also have some good questions in the chat box so I'm going to go ahead and um and read a couple of those um and I also wanted to just highlight Sandy's recommendation to look at those standard all of the wetlands applications can be downloaded from the DES website. And if you download those and look at the whole, you know, look at them before they're um, actually in your inbox to, to review, um, you can look at the standard wetland application, the permit by notification, and, and you'll get a feel for what's involved in each of those different types of applications. So that is a good way to kind of learn about the role of the Conservation Commission when you look at those forms online. So one of the questions we have is, are permits required in all cases for crossing permanent stream courses? For example, frozen, winter frozen conditions. And I think, you know, this could be, I'm gonna have somebody else answer it, but in, there may be a permit by notification, but there, there always should be a permit. Sandy, I'll let you answer that. Well, well I think Rick had mentioned, had answered, 
yes, even if it's a forester crossing with streams, um, if, if the ground is frozen, and I'm saying ground, not stream, uh, you can do forestry activities without a permit or notification um, under the state requirements. But if you're crossing a stream and you're not, um, uh, you know, spanning it, um, you do need a permit. Yeah, that's that's true, and uh, you know that it gets a little bit dicey, as many of you know. Um, the state kind of frowns on disruptions to the perennial water bodies, and per particularly streams. And um, you know, uh, we've had many instances where temporary crossings have ended up not so temporary, <laughs> mm -hmm. or or what the uh, person thought might be temporary, like. 500 pound concrete blocks is really not temporary <laughs> and and downstream effects have have taken place so it's really a you know if you have any questions about you know you want to cross a stream uh, check out the state website uh, on stream crossings you can even google that stream crossings uh, and get onto the unh uh, website as well they're um, they basically have uh, best management practices published for stream crossings for all kinds of conditions. So it's, yep. a, it's a great resource to look at. Yeah. Um, and then we had a question about future classes, including a wetland permit application. And I would say, yes, we will definitely have um, more kind of hands-on as we get further along in these sessions. I think our, our last one will be in person and we hope to have kind of example um, examples of, of wetland permit applications. So we'll be able to do more of that. But in the meantime, definitely just download them from the DES website. And then there's another question from Karen. Not sure I understand this yet. What is an example of vegetated, vegetative morphological adaptation to a wetland? So um, there are plants that are sort of designated as being um, I didn't want to get into all the indicator statuses, but the plants that are facultative are those that are, you know, can be in wetland or can be in upland. So those are still counted as wetland plants. Then there's something called facultative upland. So they are, they tend to be um, uh, kind of in, in drier settings or less often in wetlands. Um, but uh, so they're not considered wetland plants, but they may, develop these morphological adaptations and what they, um, there are a variety of them. Um, they're actually listed in that 2012 regional manual, but the, it includes things like um, when you see trees that have um, roots that are uh, very much, um, the, the tree often gets thicker toward the bottom and the roots are staying near the surface because they need to, um, uh, be able to get air exchange uh, because the ground is so wet all the time. Um, that uh, is a, one of the um, morphological adaptations. Um, you can see that in um, uh, just a number of plants, like for, for something that's that doesn't grow here, but is like a mangroves, you know, they have their roots uh exposed there in a totally wet environment um so um you know hemlocks a white pine um uh, will do that those are both facultative upland um species that do tend to um also be found in wetlands um there are um it, it's a little more difficult sometimes to identify but on some plants they have uh, dots on them that are actually called lenticels and they're sort of like breathing holes for plants and um, when they're in water uh, in saturated soil conditions they will um, get enlarged um, but sometimes it's kind of hard to say okay well is that enlarged or is that the the normal size of it um, so those are at least a couple of um, morphological adaptations Rick I'm sure you could kind of add to that list yeah Adventitious roots is a good right. one. That's right. Willows and alders. And yeah. So you know, you got there, there are like six commonly recognized <clears throat> adaptations, but you hit them, the important ones. Okay. 
We also had a question about um, a about towns with no zoning and strategies mm -hmm. for addressing conservation issues. And I I will say that we won't be able to get into that in this wetland training series, but I'm going to make a note of it because that would be a good mm -hmm. um, annual meeting and conference um, NHACC conference topic. So uh, so that is a good question, because, but it's a little outside of outside of um, the topic here. And another kind of related topic, what is the Conservation Commission role in gold dredging? <laughs> oh, one of my favorite topics. We, we um, get a cut. We get a cut of the total. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I did a lot of research on this when I was at DES. Um, I would say, um, well, first of all, the person doing the gold dredging um, there are requirements in the rules and that should be on the application. Um, among them is landowner permission. So do they have landowner permission? That's probably one of the biggest issues that's there. And I know if you know you have an absent landowner and other people observe it, that can be difficult, but um, they're required to have landowner permission and that's um, a good place to start. I would say just... Um, be familiar with the requirements so that if you see something that's an issue, you can report it and you'll know that what the standards are, that they appear to be going beyond that. Um, it's it's really, um, I don't know, it, it's kind of a, a, a tough area. Um, I, I think there was a... Um, I'm trying to think there was a potential, oh, there was a bill actually um, by Representative Oxenham a bunch of years ago that tried to um, restrict or get at the, some of the issues with the gold dredge or potential issues, um, but it um, was, there's a whole um, uh, kind of a group and they kind of descended on New Hampshire and that kind of got ITL, I think. Um, so I would just say, learn what the restrictions and, and characteristics, you know, requirements are so that you're familiar enough to report when things are a, a, an issue. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, yeah, Jerry, go ahead. I would like to ask Dr. Vanderpoel and uh, Sandy Crystal what they feel as the rigorousness of licensing for soil scientists, wetland scientists, and foresters. <laughs> oh boy. What they think oh about HB2, which oh, tends yeah. to uh, want to uh, eliminate those licenses and examinations. Yeah, I, 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 I you know, I, I read over that um, this morning, actually, um, just got the highlight and Marianne, who I think was on the call, thank you for forwarding that, um, the texts of that. Um, you know, it's like any profession. I, I There are many, uh, what, 14 that are gonna be eliminated and us soil and wetland scientists are two of those. Um, you know, it's always uh, a, a crapshoot when you open up the field to people who aren't necessarily trained uh, and don't have that experience uh, to allow them to do work that is a professional job, right? And, and I understand it's a cost-cutting measure. Uh, and certainly I'm not going to argue on, on behalf of the massage therapists and the cosmetologists of the state, but uh, in, the, on, in terms of wetland and soil, uh, it's a pretty rigorous field. I mean, we require 24 credit hours in, a, in an accredited institution as just education experience, and then two years of uh, actual experience in the field, and a requirement for a certain number of plans that have to be stamped and approved by a certified or licensed individual. This is not really any different than uh, surveying and engineering, which didn't get canned, they just got consolidated. So, you know, I, I, I'm not much in favor of, of that <laughs> at all, to be honest with you, having been at the uh, very forefront of establishing those laws in 1998. Yeah, and I, I was um, uh, doing permitting starting in 1998. And I just remember also because the wetlands rules allowed, um, a, 
you know, uh, a delineation based upon plants only and didn't require, you know, the CWS wasn't in place yet. Uh, you know, the stuff that came in was a mess, uh, I, you know, very, very often, um, but particularly uh, uh, as I used to say to people, I did uh, more, I did field inspections for some of the smallest projects and some of the largest projects because the smallest ones, they didn't have the right person to identify the resources properly and really know how to put the application together to either highlight that something was an issue or that it wasn't, and it went both ways. Yeah, yeah it I'm, sounds like it's gonna be a nightmare. For those of you who are not exactly sure what we're talking about, there's House Bill 2, which is the, the budget basically, but they've attached a, um, proposal, the governor's office has attached a proposal that would eliminate several boards, including the forestry board um, and about uh, 30 different licenses in New Hampshire and certifications, including wet certified wetland scientists and soil scientists and foresters. So um, that, you know, we see it as a problem as well, because I think a lot of conservation commissions, and I'd love to hear from you, is that we rely heavily on on that um, seal from your certified wetland scientists so that we know that you're getting reliable professional information when you're getting your wetland delineation. And that's always something that we've recommended you look for on your those um, site plans and, and all of the documentation that you're, you know, reviewing so that you know it's legit and i think it's really as sandy said can we're gonna who knows what we'll end up looking at if you don't have to have a certified wetland scientist so to me it sounds like it's gonna be a big mess um and we're planning to certainly you know voice our opposition to that as well um, we're coming up with a plan on how to do that and who best to um contact but i'd also i'd be happy to send you the um the notice of that um from the governor's or it was from the office of planning and licensing that said you know here's these changes so um i i can forward that along with yeah with and, and barbara you might put it on your on your website and a little yeah. you know uh, e-blast yeah. on that i think would be very very helpful because you know really it, i equate it well I would, but you know, yeah. oh, you, we don't have to license our medical physicians. Now we just believe, you know, they yeah. can practice medicine without a license. <laughs> it's yeah. it's not a whole lot different. <laughs> well, it was interesting. The LNAs, licensed nursing assistants, are also not right. going to be. There's there's right. no um, requirement for that as well. So there's it's a slippery slope, and it's it's very. Um, it's pretty, pretty terrible and scary. So, um, yeah, I will, we'll get the word out and, and try to get some feedback and, and come up with a plan. So, um, crazy stuff. Uh, let's hope that, I don't know. Um, there is one more question that I'd like to hear. So, um, are BMPs required or recommended? And maybe we can just, um, I, um, so I, I'd be happy to, to yeah, jump go ahead. Into right that on. one. Um, BMPs are are recommended. They're not you know, rule uh, it per se. Mm -hmm. That is to say, they are embedded in our rules, and you could be cited if there was a review of a permit, for example, or a monitoring report after the permit was completed, and where BMPs were not being followed, you could be cited for that, for a violation. That is to say, they couldn't use it as a standard in court for the violation, but the result or symptom of the violation they could use according to the law that intends to protect the quality, say, of the water involved. But that's, and that's always, it's always been a little bit of a tricky thing. I mean, when, when the Forest Society put out the, you know, best uh, good, good forestry in the Granite State publication. Um, you know, I think the goal there, as with all of our BMPs, is to educate the public and make them aware of the fact that we've got these best management practices and that we should adhere to them to the, to the greatest degree possible. But as we all know, that doesn't always happen. And, um, and so, you know, that, that is, it's unfortunate, but that is why they were put out there. 
And our laws and our and our rules do not provide all of the necessary guidance that you need in say sequencing a construction project from start to finish. They ask for that information when you're applying for the permit, but they certainly don't check that during the permit's enactment and after it's been approved. So that's that's been an issue for a long, long time. Uh, thank you for that question, Hoover. Yeah, uh, Rick, I, 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 I would say that they're, you know, they may not be rules, but they are referred to in the rules. And and I'm not talking good forest in the in the guard in the uh, Granite State is that is a, a a nice to do document that's not cited in the rules. But there are timber harvesting BMPs um, that are that are specifically cited in the rules. And I would say the thing is that. If someone goes out and they're not applying BMPs and there's a violation because they're rutting and they didn't put down, you know, corduroy in the resource or whatever, I mean, that's the violation. They didn't follow the BMPs, but yes, there was a problem there. If they went to a site and and just said, well, where's your XYZ, but there's no uh, indication that there's a violation, yeah, I, I think that, you know, just putting down corduroy for the sake of corduroy is not the purpose, but it's really to to cross a you know a resource that meets the criteria. So, I I you know I, I think uh, it's semantics what Rick's saying. Or what yeah, I'm saying. it's I think it's important to know that they're not. It's not a regulation, but it is cited in the rules. So it's kind yeah, of yeah. I would I you know but I was going to try and pull it up because I I just yeah. I think that DES considers it. A requirement yeah it's cited okay. in the rules and you know yeah. uh, so it, it's a little stronger than than yeah but it's tricky all right here's a good question though on um gis uh, will the impact of gis systems on mapping and protecting what will be the impact of gis on mapping and protecting wetlands if the boundaries are not defined well is the wetland at risk um and i think you should be aware though that uh, GIS does not necessarily cover all your wetlands, but I'm yes. gonna let you two answer that. Yep, yep. I mean, GIS is not, I mean, um, the like National Wetland, and I, I, I will say that I was at a meeting where a project was presented and, and they tried to say that, you know, the National Wetland Inventory showed that there are no wetlands there. And I went, uh, you know, that's not adequate. You have to field delineate wetlands. Um, and so um, GIS is only uh, a platform for data. You could put into GIS field delineated wetlands, but I think what's being referred to more is the like national wetland inventory. And, and you're not going to get all wetlands from, um, you know, remotely sensed data. So. Um, yeah, so, so that's a, that's a good question. And I look at GIS, for example, as a good planning tool, mm -hmm. but not a good permitting tool, right? The requirement in a permit application that you provide your project site on a one to 24,000 USGS map, great, you can use GIS for that. They require a tax map, you can use GIS for that. But when it comes to actually stating how much impact you're going to have on a wetland. You have to do the field work and there's no two ways about it. Now, the trickiest part that I find, and I thought this might be the source of the question, is that when you have a prime wetland designated in a town, that is by GIS. And in fact, a lot of our earlier primes were by hard copy map. <laughs> and then the question becomes, well, if you're, wetland shows the prime or your map shows the prime wetland in a certain area and somebody's doing a say a timber management project near that area who checks what's on the ground as to where the actual edge of the prime wetland is and the answer is simply nobody <laughs> and it rarely i mean i've only done that once or twice where i live and i live in a town with one of the earlier uh, prime wetland maps where I was contacted by a forester and say, could you please flag the edge of prime because we don't know where it is. And I flagged the edge of wet. I flagged the upland edge to the, the wetland, even though 
the prime wetland itself was largely mapped for the very, very poorly drained open water part of that wetland. Was I doing it accurately? I could have probably been taken to court over that because the map was different than the line that I flagged on the ground. And that gets a little tricky. I mean, I'm into protecting the resource at all costs. So I'm gonna flag the edge of wet, but I could have been legally wrong by doing so in a town where the map itself, which by the way, cause I know I've got some of my town people on this call is only about 80% accurate for where it actually is. So. We've got issues with that, certainly relative to the GIS version versus um, the on the ground uh, mapping. And the other question we we get with prime wetlands is, you know, how do you update them if they have changed or, you know, these are living systems so they can kind of, you know, adapt as, as things get more, you know, so I found out the hard way in case anybody's out there okay, there's yeah. 26 towns because our town tried to do that. I, I made this little note back about 10 years ago with our last NRI update strategic plan. We should update the prime wetlands map. Well, we looked into it and the short answer is you can't. <laughs> uh, because if you did, you'd have to take it to the voters of the town, first of all, and then second of all, you'd have to pass it and approve it through the state whose current law guidance suggests that you're really not protecting the prime wetland at all. You're only protecting the very poorly drained soils that are at least 50 feet wide in every nook and cranny across the prime wetland. And that's the way the law is written now. So basically you'd be losing ground and would not be able to contest any issues because the wetland line, according to the current rules in prime or current law in prime, is in the middle of the wetland. <laughs> it's not even at the edge. It's wherever there's a 50 foot wide zone of water saturated soil. And so, you know, we basically found out the hard way that no, can't you don't do want it. to update them. Yeah. Don't want now, to do it. <laughs> I have heard um, Marianne. Uh, Tilton from DES is not on on today's program, but I believe they are trying to update the rules uh, or they're in the process of updating the rules for how to update a prime wetland. So we'll we'll see if there's Stay progress tuned. there. Well, All right. Can I, I, one, we last, have, one question. Yeah, go ahead, Jerry. Will those new rules uh, be retroactive to prime wetlands that were approved in, in 1992 by a warrant article for the town? No. You still have to go through the process. No, it, for any future stuff. You don't have to change your existing yep. ones. You don't have oh, to change okay. it. It's only if you wanted to update it, then that's yeah. where you'd have to go back. Yeah. All right, fine, thank you. Yeah, all right, so we have one more question. I'm not really sure how this fits in, but maybe, um, so it says, doesn't EPA demand SWPPP Swift. plan? and inspections to be done on any construction project over one acre, and, and which wouldn't that cover the BMPs? Yeah, well, the uh, the, the thing is that there, there are BMPs for yep. many different things. Yes. And at the lower end of the spectrum, you have the timber harvesting BMPs, um, you have the um, trail construction and maintenance BMPs. So we kind of talk about those things and then, Yes, you have the larger construction projects, impacts over an acre that have BMPs and it's, you know, alteration of terrain has their manual, multi-volume volume manual that with, with uh, BMPs in there. So um, for those projects that those do have BMPs and it's my understanding that that stuff that would be required and, and um, I, I think we were thinking more of the lower end notification processes uh, and BMPs rather than the larger projects. So uh, thank you for bringing that up because yeah. it's it's uh, not always so clear. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, we use BMPs for a lot of different practices, and um, and they, you know, the avoidance and minimization um, best management. There's a, there's a lot out there. So um, we can always follow up if, if you have a more specific question on a BMP. So, all right, well, we, we, uh, we've uh, covered a lot. And again, I will be sending out the recording link 
to this program later today, along with uh, a lot of the resources recommended in the program, as well as some others. Um, the first program that we recorded the introduction to wetland identification is now on our YouTube channel. So um, we'll I'll send a link to that as well. So if you did miss that program, you can still watch the recording. And um, so I wanna thank uh, Sandy and Rick for all they've been doing to help this these programs um, happen and, and all the work and expertise that they've shared with us today. Um, our next program is going to be on um, DES online GIS mapping tools, and that's going to be on Wednesday, March 8th. So that's coming up, and I will also be sending the uh, registration link as well in the follow-up email. So um, again, thank you all for all that you do. I'm glad that you're here to, to learn more about uh, protecting wetlands in your community. Um, you're welcome to, to follow up with me as well. If you have any questions or need more information, need an example of a wetland ordinance, that kind of thing, I'm happy to help. So again, uh, have a great afternoon. It's beautiful out there. So maybe you can enjoy some of the snow we've had. Um, and uh, again, appreciate your time. Have a great afternoon. And we'll we'll see you in a couple weeks, I think. <laughs> all right. Great. All right. Thank you all Thank for you. attending.